Hey, thanks for joining us online at The Assembly. We believe in biblical teaching and preaching, and this message is designed to proclaim the hope of Jesus. So feel free to share this video with a friend or on your social media. And we would love to stay connected, so be sure to follow our channel. Hope this message encourages you. I want to share a verse of scripture because it really does explain um, what's taken place this morning, especially. Brother Dean and Peggy Caldwell are evangelists, and they travel the nation proclaiming and preaching and teaching the Word of God. But not only that, they do ministers' conferences, they do marriage con I mean, this man will preach and teach God's Word wherever the door is open to him. But it was interesting, we were talking this morning, and Brother Dean, you shared this passage of Scripture, but I thought, you know, this, what we are experiencing, is a gift from God to us and to the church. An evangelist. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11 says, Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, and the evangelists. Brother Dean, you're a gift to the church. It's more than a title to you. It really is an office that God has placed upon your heart and your life. Sister Peggy's not able to be with us today. She had something a little bit more important, and that is to take care of their granddaughter who is sick. Rob and Tara Walker, who are uh, Dean and Peggy's daughter and son-in-law. Many of you may remember them if you were here when the All-State Youth Choir was here. Uh, Rob and, and Tara actually were the tour pastors. They're the ones that oversee that. They are the music uh, worship pastors at First Assembly in Russellville, and their daughter has not been feeling good, and so uh, Miss Peggy was going to be grandma today and take care, and I know it just broke her heart, and so, uh, but she will, planning on being here Wednesday night, they'll be with us Wednesday night, but today as, uh, as we prepare to receive the word of God from Brother Dean Caldwell, um, I just felt like I needed to share with you that this man and what he does for the church is not just something he does, but according to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11, God has given us a gift this morning. How many is ready to receive the word of God through the gift that Jesus has given to the church? How many is ready for the word of God this morning? Will you stand and welcome our guest speaker this morning, Brother Dean Caldwell, as he comes and gives us the word that God has laid upon his heart? For this church. Thank you, man. Thanks so much, <laughs> brother. Love you, pal. <laughs> Amen. Thank you. Thank you. I was thinking of a scripture just sat in there at my seat, the very first scripture of the Bible, Genesis 1 and 1. He said, In the beginning, God, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Have you ever noticed the Bible starts out assuming you believe in God? It doesn't tell you where God comes from. There's no family history. There's no background. He just said, in the beginning, God. It starts out assuming you believe there is a God and believe in God. That also means the Bible is not a book to prove the existence of God. It's a book about the already existing God. Aren't you glad you know him? And you can come to the house of God and just worship with the saints of God, the living God that lives forever. Thank you, Pastor, for the invitation of being here. It's just wonderful. We've looked forward to this, and uh, we're excited about being here today. I know Sunday morning is always crowded for time and trying to get everything in, so I'm not going to take a lot of preliminaries. Brother Gary's already told you why uh, Miss Peggy is not here today, and, and uh, she chose to stay at home and I take care of that baby, which is very sick, and so uh, keep her in prayer. Just keep her in prayer that God would touch our, our granddaughter. Well, let's get right into the Word of God this morning. If you have your Bibles and would like to read with me, I want to read three scriptures from the book of St. John, chapter number 3. And uh, now when they post these scriptures up here, it's going to be in King James Version. It's not that I don't believe in other versions. It's the fact is I am so old that I memorized the King James Version back years, 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 years. Well, the Statue of Liberty was just a little girl when I started learning <laughs> how to memorize the Scripture. But anyway, uh, I'm too old to learn another version. That's the, that's the uh, uh, big and small, great and 
large of the whole thing is, but in John, St. John chapter number three, I want to read verse three, verse five, and verse number seven. And I want to ask you, would you honor the reading of the scripture by standing this morning, if you would? When I get started, you may appreciate this stand. <laughs> St. John chapter 3, verse number 3. Now, Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus in this chapter here. But he said in verse number 3, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, look at verse 5. Verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And then verse 7. Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again. Wow. Three scriptures that identify what it takes to make heaven, and that's being born again. Verse 3 said you can't see the kingdom of God without being born again. That means there's no way that you can understand the kingdom of God without first having a relationship with the Lord. Now, that means sometimes you've got a household and you've got people living in your house that don't know Jesus, and they, for the life of you, can't understand why you want to go to church more than two times a week. They don't get that. Don't understand that. That's not persecution. That's just they're not born again, and they don't have a clue what you've got. But verse 5 said, if you're not born of water and spirit, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. I wish I had time to get into that part there because water represents the Word of God. It's a symbol of the Word of God. And Jesus is the Word of God. He is the living Word. But then verse 7 said, Marvel not that I say unto you, you gotta, you just gotta be born again. You must be born again. You can't make heaven without it. You can get to heaven sick, you can get there crippled, you can get there blind, but you can't get there unsaved. You must be born again. Let's ask God's favor on this service this morning. Father, I am so thankful that you have afforded us another privilege to be back in the house of God. We thank you for your favor. We thank you for the worship time. This morning, God, we felt your anointing, Holy Spirit, in this place already in our worship this morning. I pray that you'd move, that there's one person in this house that don't know you as personal Savior. I pray right now conviction begin to deal with their heart and lead them into the knowledge of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Bless, I pray in Jesus' name, and we thank you, Lord. Praise God, praise God. You may be seated this morning. I want to just speak to you along the lines of what it takes to be saved, why God said you have to be born again. What is it all about? In this land that we live in, in America, in 2009, a statement was made from the leadership of our country that the United States was no longer considered a Christian nation. And that's, the, that's a fact. We're no longer considered a Christian nation. The hub of Christianity is in the country of Africa and also in the country of South America. But biblically, in order for a country to be considered uh, a non-Christian nation that one time was a Christian nation, you have to be at least three generations removed from God. And in order for that to take place, you and I are living among people today that does not know the terminology of the church. They don't know what you mean when you say to them, are you born again? They don't have a clue as what you're saying when you ask them, have you been saved? Do you know who Jesus is? A young man told me this a couple years back. I asked him, I said, when was the first time you heard about Jesus? He said, well, I was in high school. And he said, I was in my senior year and someone asked me, we're not talking about a third world country, we're talking about Arkansas, the United States. He said, someone asked me, do you know Jesus? And I said to them, what year did he graduate in? I might know him, just what year did he graduate in? Had no clue about who Jesus is. What are you saying, church? I'm telling you, we have our work 
cut out for us. We are living among people today in our country that does not know the terminology of the church. They don't have a clue what it means to be saved, to be born again. Now, that may be strange to us because if you grew up in the part of the country I grew up in, I grew up in the mountains of Arkansas, way way in the mountains, everybody there at one time or another had been in church. We had all been baptized. I tell everybody, boy, if baptism will get you to heaven, I've got it made. I have been baptized in Big Creek, Buffalo River, the Red River, the White River, the Black River, and Wildcat Springs. I mean, I because they said repent and do your first works over. <laughs> and I followed water baptism a lot whenever I was growing up. But we're living in a world that does not know who Jesus is. They don't know about the gift of salvation. What are you going to tell them? How are you going to explain to them when they ask you, why do I need to be born again? What's the reason of being born again? Why do I need to be saved? What what I need to be saved from? What I need, and, and, and the church world is facing this dilemma, and sadly, we don't know how to deal with what we're facing in our world, the challenges that we have. And what I want to do this morning is take it from the beginning from the beginning in the scripture and bring it all the way through as to why the scripture says you must be born again. What was Jesus talking about when he, ta- when he spoke to Nicodemus? And by the way, Nicodemus was a church goer. He was involved in the temple scene. But when Jesus told him you had to be born again, he was clueless as to what Jesus was even talking about. He said, I'm an old man. How can I enter my mother's womb and be born again? Jesus explained to him the difference in what born again needs to be and what needs to happen. So let's begin with this. If you want to follow me in your scripture, I'm going to go back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 1 and verse number 26. This is the first scripture in the Bible that mentions mankind. It's the first scripture that God speaks about and speaks to mankind. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. And God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the fowl of the air, the cattle, over all the earth and creeping things that creep up on the earth. God said in the first phrase of verse 26, let us make man. Let us make man. Now the word man in the Hebrew there is humus. It's where we get our English word human from. The word humus means a dirt body with a spirit living in it. That's what God said. Let us make man. Let us make a dirt body with a spirit living in it. And then he said, let's give the dirt body with a spirit living in it dominion on this earth. Let me take a little detour here and explain something. That's the reason why Satan had to possess a serpent in order to appear in the Garden of Eden. Why? Because God made a decree that nothing that else but a dirt body with a spirit living in it is all that has rights and privileges on this earth. And Satan was a spirit being, so he had to possess something that had a dirt body in order to even show up in the Garden of Eden. I don't have time to go through that, but you can read all that in Genesis chapter number three. But God said, let us make man in our image. Image is what you look like. After our likeness, likeness is what we act like. I know you've heard this term many times in your life. He's a spitting image of his dad. She is the spitting image of her her mom. Now, I don't know where the spitting come in there, but I've heard that, and I know what it means. They look like. They have characteristics. They have actions. They, they have features of their, of their kin folks, their family that's there. But God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Now watch this for a moment of time. Go to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, let me look here, verse uh, number 7. Genesis 2 and verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life, 
and man became a living soul. Now look at this verse of Scripture. Verse 26 of chapter 1, you have to have a dirt body with a spirit living in you to have rights and privileges on this earth. But here, this Scripture makes man the highest creation that God created because God put a third element in mankind called the soul. We are spirit, soul, and body. That's how God formed us, and that's how God made us. The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, the dust of the earth, and breathed into man's nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. If you was reading this in the Hebrew Chronicles, here's what it would tell you, that God physically came down from heaven to this earth. When he got to this earth, he cast his image in the dust of the earth. And with his finger, he traced out his image in the dust of the earth. And with his breath, he breathed into that traced out image. And when he did, Adam just peeled right out of the ground. That is the creative, spoken creative power of God. Adam was made in the image of God. He was made to look like God. He was made to act like God. What does it mean to act like God? He was eternal. Death did not come on the scene until after Adam had disobeyed God. So God placed Adam on this earth to be an eternal creature. He was placed here to live forever. That was God's intention. Can I tell you, that's still God's intention. You and I are eternal beings. We have a soul and spirit. We're going to live forever, somewhere in eternity, either with God or without God. But we are eternal beings. Now then, God had made Adam and placed him on this planet Earth. Now go to Genesis chapter 2. I hope I gave whoever's post these scriptures these here because I have a tendency sometimes to deviate from that. But I'll, I'll give you a couple seconds ahead of time before I give it out there, all right? In Genesis 2 and verse number 18, now watch this. God said it's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helpmate, he said. I'm going to make him somebody that will stand beside him. It's not good that man should be alone. Now watch this. All the creation that God had, he did not need a cheering section to back up and pat him on the back and say, God, you did good. You've done it, boy. You have done it. No, God patted his own self on the back and said, it's good. But here's the only time in creation that God said it's not good. He said it's not good that man should be alone. The word alone is two English words, all one. Pull it apart, all one. Put it together alone. When you're all one, you're by yourself. You're, you are alone. God said, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helpmate for him. I'm going to make him somebody that will stand by his side. Now keep in mind, follow me. Adam was made in the image and in the likeness of God. Now skip down to verse 23. I'm in Genesis chapter 2, verse 23. God put Adam to sleep and done some kind of surgery on him. And when Adam woke up, there was a woman there. <laughs> now watch what Adam said in verse 23. He said, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. Watch this now. Because she was taken out of man. Oh, look at that. God never went back to the dust of the earth to make another person. Eve came out of Adam. That means when God created Adam, he had already created Eve. She had not been formed at that time, but God had created her. Later on, he put Adam to sleep, and he brought Eve out of Adam to stand by his side. Wow. When Miss Peggy and I do marriage uh, 
uh, retreats. This is one message I preach explaining the one flesh, what it means when God said in his word, you're no longer two, but you're one in the sight of God. Adam was physically one with Eve and Eve was physically one with Adam. But you and I, through covenant of our spouse, we become one in the sight of God. Man, I'm tempted to preach on that right here and now, but I'm gonna try to stay <coughs> on my point. And before I get on with this, but now watch this. Understand what God is saying in the word of God. Then all of a sudden, Satan comes on the scene. He shows up in the Garden of Eden. And when he does, Eve, the counter, or, or, or the, the part of Adam that was taken out of Adam. I'm going to take a little detour here because I feel this so strong because I just said that about the one flesh. And let me look this up. I'm not sure if I gave you this or not, but if I did, it'll be Genesis 5 and verse number Two, Genesis chapter 5 and verse 2. I want you to see this because this is just powerful in the scripture. Genesis 5 and verse number 2. The Bible said, male and female made he them. God knew there was two people there. Male and female made he them and blessed them, still plural, and called their, T-H-E-I-R, possessive plural, call their name Adam, singular, from the day they were created. Wow, look at that. Male and female made he them. Let me read that in Cozy Home, Arkansas language where we can all get our mind around that. Adam and Eve, God made them. Adam and Eve, God blessed them. Adam and Eve were blessed of God, but he called them Adam. Wow, look at that. That goes back to the one flesh again. What does that mean, sir? Listen to me. When you are blessed of God, so is your wife. When your wife is blessed of God, so are you as well. But God said he called them Adam. Adam. What does that mean? When God made Adam, he had already made Eve. She had not been formed at that time, but God had made Eve. What does that mean? In God's thinking, God when made Adam, he made every living person on this planet in God's thinking. What does that mean? It doesn't matter if you grew up in foster care. It doesn't matter if you grew up as an adopted person. Whether you ever knew your mother or your father, that doesn't matter. God knew you was coming. And God has a plan for you. Get past the fact that of who you've been in the past and know that God God knows who you are. You're not an accident. You're not a slip up. You're not, uh, you're not something that just slipped in. God knew you was coming. And he has a plan for you in the kingdom of God. All you need to do is forget about whether you know your mom and dad or not, whether you was adopted or grew up in foster care, and just know God's got a plan for me, and I'm going to fit in the kingdom of God, and I'm going to be who God wants me to be. Somebody needed to hear that this morning. God had made Adam and Eve and placed them in the Garden of Eden. Now then, the devil slipped in. I'm back on track now. The devil slipped in. And when the devil slipped in, he came to Eve. Now, here's what I want to point something out to you from this story. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 14. Let me read this where we'll know where I'm coming from. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse number 14. Adam was not deceived. Don't that knock your hat in the creek. Adam was not deceived. But the woman being deceived was in transgression. What does that mean? Adam knew what was going to happen when he disobeyed God. He knew that. I was doing a preacher's convention here a few years ago and one of the pastors came up to me and he had his finger in the Bible. I hate to see that. 
because I get to wanting to look for a door because they've always found some problem there. And he said to me, he said, Brother Dean, he said, I'm just going to tell you I've been studying the Word of God and I've got this theological deal. And I said, wonderful. He said, I believe if you just step out and sin willfully, there's no more repentance for sin. I said, I know where you're coming from. That's Hebrews 10, 26, but that's not what that means. I said, brother, I can't ever recall a time in my life that I accidentally sinned. Every time I've ever sinned, I planned it out. <laughs> Maybe you're holier than I am. I hope you are. Every time I've ever sinned, it, it didn't slip up on me. And I said, oh, God, please excuse me. No. I just planned it out. And usually it has something to do with my temper. That's generally the bottom cause with me. He said, you mean to tell me that you don't believe in accidental sin? I said, I'm sure there is, but I, I've never accidentally sinned. I grew up knowing the Word of God. My dad was a pastor, and he told me this and that, and you ain't going to make heaven, boy. You, you need more of God. Yeah, my dad was an old-time preacher. He preached Jesus is coming at midnight, and there ain't nobody going. <laughs> there ain't nobody going. Yeah. When he got in Matthew 24 and Luke 17, he'd say two in the field, one taken, one left. Two in the bed and ain't neither one of them going. Yeah. I grew up hard, boy. We went in the altar looking for sin. If I can just find it, I can got 24 hours of grace left here of some kind. But listen to me. Adam sinned willfully. He walked in on Eve and the serpent was there and, and Eve was deceived and she was the first to partake of the forbidden fruit. And she gave the forbidden fruit to Adam and he willfully partook of the forbidden fruit and disobeyed God. You see, that was what the first sin was. Man chose to believe what the devil said instead of what God said. And so the Bible said, there they are in the Garden of Eden. Their eyes are open. They have sinned willfully. Why is that? Genesis 3, verse 7 and 8. Genesis chapter 3, verse 7 and 8. Look at this, verse 7. The eyes of them both were open. They knew they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made aprons for themselves. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of God among the trees in the garden. Now what does this say? This is saying that there was a routine visit from God. How do we know that? Verse 8, they heard the voice of God, knew exactly who it was, and they hid from the presence of God. Why? Because verse 7 said their eyes were open. They knew they were naked. Now let me clear this up. Their clothes didn't rot off of them when they partook of the forbidden fruit. They wasn't wearing any clothes. They was covered in the righteousness of God. And when they sinned, they lost the righteous covering. Now their eyes are open and they pulled fig leaves and made garments for themselves. And they come out of hiding and standing before God wrapped in fig leaves. You won't find this in the King James, NIV, New King James, and the ESP or anything else. But I believe God said, hey, guys, what's going on? Wow. That's talent. You can make clothes out of leaves. That's good. But let me help you with something here. I want to show you something from the Word of God. God looked at them and said, you can't cover your own sin. You can't sanctify your own self. You need a Savior because God had set the penalty of death on sin. And the Word of God says, I know I didn't give you this, and brother, I apologize, but it's in Genesis 3 and verse, let me look here, verse uh, 21. And unto Adam and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. 
God performed the first sacrifice that was ever performed because he had pronounced the penalty of death. Something had to die. If you was reading this in the Hebrew Chronicles, here's what it says. There's two sheep over there eating grass. They're totally innocent of the sin of Adam and Eve. They had nothing to do with the sin of Adam and Eve, but the penalty of death had to be paid. So God took the life of those two sheep, and look how smart God is. He took the covering off of those sheep, the skins on their back that covered their innocent bodies. He removed their covering of their innocence and transferred it to the guilty. God performed the first sacrifice that was ever performed. Now Adam and Eve are now covered because God made the sacrifice. But why did Adam sin willfully? What is that all about? Because it it gives us some insight as to who Jesus is to you and I. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45. He said the first Adam was a living soul, but the last Adam was a quickening spirit. Why is Jesus referred to as the last Adam? Here's why. Because Adam walked in on his wife Eve, who had disobeyed God and partaken the forbidden fruit. He knew that on God's routine visit, God would take Eve and cast her out of the garden, and they would forevermore be separated. So Adam willfully becomes sin with Eve, so they would not forevermore be separated. Jesus willfully came from heaven down to this earth, took my sin upon him, your sin upon him, so we would not be eternally separated. The first Adam and the last Adam. Jesus made it so we could live with him forever and forever. The first Adam and the last Adam. Now watch this. When Adam and Eve sinned, something happened. They lost their covering of righteousness. But more than that, they lost even more that. Go to Genesis chapter 5, brother, and verse 3. Genesis chapter 5 and verse number 3. Listen to this. This is several years after the fall, but it explains something to us. Genesis chapter 5 and verse number 3 said Adam was 130 years old. He begot a son after his own likeness and his image, and he called his name Seth. Now remember, in Genesis 1 and 26, and God said, let us make man in our image, and after likeness, image is first, likeness is last. After the fall, it is recorded in Genesis 5 and 3, Adam's 130 years old, but he begot a son after his likeness, likeness is first, image is last. Why? This explains born again. Watch this. In the fall of man, man never lost the image of God. We lost the likeness of God. Let me explain that. When Adam failed, he never lost his arms, he never lost his legs, his ears, his eyes, but what he lost was the likeness of God. That was lost in the fall of man. Man brought death when he failed God, when God had intended for him to be eternal and live eternally. But man lost the image or the likeness of God. He never lost the image of God. So when Jesus said, You have to be born again, here's how it happens. When you come to an altar of prayer, 
whether it's in a church, a hospital bed, a steering wheel of a vehicle behind the house, wherever it's at, and you make yourself an altar and you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sin, come into your life, here's literally what happens. God removes the sin out of your life and he births in you the likeness of God that was lost in the fall of man. Now you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. All things are passed away and all things are become new. Now you have been born again. Does it make you perfect? No, not by a long shot. But now you've got something birthed inside of you that you're going to grow. You're going to nurture. You're going to mature it in your life. You're going to start out a babe in Christ and you're going to mature to a saint of God following the direction of God. But you birthed in you is the likeness of God that was lost in the fall of man. Now you're a new creature in Christ Jesus. You You're saved by grace. Now you've got something living inside of you that when you stumble, when you falter, when you disobey God, it rises up on the inside and says, Dean, you can do better than that. I didn't have that before. But now birthed in me is the likeness of God. Jesus living inside of me, living inside of you. And I'm saying to you that are here today, if you have never let Jesus live inside of you, you're not born again. Because the likeness of God has to be birthed inside of you in order for the term born again to be fulfilled in you. It's Jesus living inside of you. And we said here today, we want all of our loved ones, we want all of our family to know Jesus as Lord of our life. I'm going to shift gears here just a little bit and bring something to your understanding this morning. How do you talk to family members that don't know Jesus? How do you talk to friends and neighbors that don't know Jesus as Lord of your life. And if you ask them, you get to the point of asking them to be born again. Now you can explain it to them because birthed in us is the likeness of God that was lost in the fall of man. We become new creatures in Christ Jesus. Let me help you with something. Something that I have used for years and years and years and literally without exaggeration have led hundreds to the Lord through this one little thing here. When you start talking to someone about their soul, their heart, their life, you start with something that everybody's acquainted with, and that's death. We don't like to talk about it, but everybody in this building, should the Lord tarry 100 years from now, you're probably not going to be here. We're all facing death. People that do not go to church, people that do not know God, they know about death. They've lost parents, they've lost friends, they've lost children, they've lost loved ones. They're acquainted with death. And here's how I do it. When you die and you're going to stand before God and God asks you, why should I let you into my kingdom, what are you going to tell him? Let me show you the difference here. If I come up to you and I look you in the face and I say, are you born again? No, sir. Do you want to be born again? No, sir. Then conversation's over. If I push, it's going to turn you off. But if I ask you a question that you need to answer without yes or no, And I ask you, when you stand before God and God looks at you and says to you, why should I let you into my kingdom? What are you going to tell him? Your answer is not yes or no. And it opens the door to tell them about the power, the strength of Jesus Christ. I had a brother-in-law, hard. He was so hard. We coon hunted together. We worked together. Good man. But when you try to talk to him about God and church, he could bring up more people that used to be in church that's not in church anymore. Then he'd throw in a few preachers. They used to preach and they don't preach anymore. 
The problem with that, I knew those same people. I remember getting word from the family that he was in the hospital in Little Rock. And Miss Peggy and I were headed up for revival at Cave City. And I said to her, I said, we get everything set up. We're going to drive back to Little Rock. I went back to Little Rock, walked in the room where my brother-in-law was at. He was married to my wife's sister. She had died and he had remarried. I walked inside the hospital and I went up there and just joking and carrying on with him. Sat down on the side of the hospital bed, took his hand. I said, James, they tell me it's not good. You're facing death. He said, yes. I said, James, one day you're going to stand before God. God's going to look at you and say, James, why should I let you in my kingdom? What are you going to tell him? He said, well, I'm going to tell him I want in. I said, that's good, bud. But the only way you can get in is through being born again. And I explained to him about being born again. The reason I'm telling this story because you're going to encounter this. After I explained to him, I'm thinking, boy, this is great. I took him by the hand. I said, James, would you like to pray today? And let Jesus be Lord of your life. He looked at me and said, no, not today. And I knew conversation was over. We finished the revival at Cave City, loaded up and went way up in Missouri. I set everything up there and I said, Peggy, I know we're six hours from home, but I've got to try one more time to talk to him. We drove back. On that Thursday, got there, got home Friday morning sometime, 2 o'clock in the morning, went to bed, got up, called his daughter. She said, Dean, they're releasing Dad today on hospice, bringing him home. If you come, you're going to miss him. Wait till tomorrow, which was Saturday, and we had to drive back to Missouri to start revival Sunday morning. I got up that morning, and I told Miss Peggy, I said, I don't know how long this is going to take. I said, but I'm going to make heaven surreal. He wished he was already there. And I'm going to make hell so hot he can smell smoke in the living room. I don't know how long this is going to take. When I drove up there, they were parked down the driveway, down the side of the highway. I started walking up the driveway. Many of the family members come meeting me. And they're saying, Dean, get in there and do it. He's He's facing death. Get in there and lead him to the Lord. And I'm looking at them and thinking, you're as lost as a ball in high weeds. <laughs> yeah. You know, the difference was they wasn't dying. That's the difference. It was cold. It was in March. His little wife came out. She's a precious little lady, a little short lady and she said, Dean, I'm so glad you're here. I'm going to put everybody out of the house. It's just going to be you and James. I said, Claire, this may take a while. It's cold outside. She said, we'll take a chance on freezing. We want you to just tell him, get to him. He's in the hospital bed in the living room. I went in there and let that side down, hopped up on the side of the bed. I'm ready for however long it takes. Reached over and took him by the hand and I said, James, do you know why I'm here? He began to cry and said, yes, Dean, and I'm ready to pray. Ten minutes to 11 o'clock, I led James to the Lord on Saturday. Seven o'clock Sunday morning, he went into eternity. What if I hadn't have known what to do? You know what happened? I planted the seed. The week before on Saturday. And God caused it to mature and grow. Explaining as to why you've got to be born again. Our physician was my nephew, my wife's niece's husband. Great guy. But when Kelly contacted cancer, 
just needed God. From time to time, he would call me, and we would be out of state, and he'd say, when you're coming home, we need to have a Bible study. I need you to explain some things to my friends that you explained to me. He said, we'll have some, we'll have a big Bible study. He said, Dean, you tell me when you're coming, we'll have beer and we'll have some cigars and we'll just have a good Bible study. I said, never been to one quite like that. (laughs) But I said, I'll be there. I'll be there. Before we got home. He was in the hospital. Dr. May met me. I was going to the hospital, and Dr. May said, Dean, get down there and talk to him about Jesus. He's dying. He's got a room full of people. They're planning a big party. He knows I know unless God does something, he's at the end. We took hands there in the hallway of the hospital, and Dr. May prayed this prayer. God, get everybody out of that room. And let this preacher plant a seed of God. I walked in the room and the nurse followed me and she said, everybody out. I said, boy, this ain't what we prayed. But Kelly raised up and said, nurse, everybody can go but him. And I knew God was doing something. Long story short, I said, Kelly, it's not looking good. He said, no, Dean, if we don't hear something from MDN, M.D. Anderson or Tulsa, he said, I'm at the end. I said, Kelly, one day you're going to stand before God and God's going to say, why should I let you into my kingdom? What are you going to tell him? He said, I'm going to look at God, sir, and I'm going to say, God, I tried everything I knew to try, and I still can't find peace. See, he's used to analyzing and testing and doing all that. And I explained to him the gift of salvation of being born again, what I just explained to you. I took Kelly by the hand. We prayed a sinner's prayer. He looked at me, and he said, I didn't know it was this easy. I didn't know it was this easy. Being born again, would you bow your heads with me, please, this morning? If you're in this house and you don't know Jesus, I've explained to you how the Lord will move sin out of your life and birth in you the likeness of God. He will birth in you something that was lost in the fall of man and you can be a new creature in Christ Jesus and it's that easy. But you have to do it. Even though the price has been paid, you have to do it. I feel conviction in this place this morning. I feel God in this place. I want to ask, is there anybody in this house today, you're not right with God, you know you're not right with God? You may not understand the terminology of being born again, but what it is is God birthing in you the likeness of God that was lost in the fall of man. You can leave here being born again knowing that you're ready to meet Jesus and to make heaven. And I'm wondering if there's anybody here, you just slip your hand up and by you lifting your hand, you're making a statement. I need the Lord. I'm not here to embarrass anybody. I need Jesus in my life. Is there a hand anywhere? Just slip it up. Preacher, I'm not right with God, but I want to be right with God. There's a hand. Is there another one? Just slip your hand up. Join this. Is there anybody else here? I don't want to miss a soul. You just need Jesus to be Lord to you. And you just slip your hand up. You lift in your hand. You're making a statement. I need the Lord. I need Jesus. See, this is serious stuff. We're all facing eternity. We're going to live eternity 
in eternity somewhere, you may put your hand down. Is there anybody else? Slip your hand up. Pray for me, preacher. I need the Lord. There's another hand. I see another hand over here. Anyone else? Preacher, I need Jesus. I'm not right with God, but I want to be. I don't want to leave this world lost in my sin. I want to know him as Lord of my life. Is there anyone else? There's another hand. You may put your hand down. Anybody else? I need Jesus. I need the Lord. Now I'm going to ask this question because I ended up on this note. How many here would slip your hand up and by you lifting your hand, you're making this statement? Preacher, God has placed somebody on my heart. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a friend to talk to them about their soul, but I really don't know how to talk to them about Jesus. But I'm going to take what you preach today and I'm going to pray that God open the door. That God has placed somebody on your heart. You have a burden and you don't know how to get to them and we're going to pray with you that God opened that door. How many would slip your hand up right now? Hands going up all over this place. I don't know how to talk with them. But they do need Jesus. Now I'm going to ask you to do something. You that lifted your hand for salvation. I'm not trying to embarrass you, but I'm going to tell you something. There's coming a day when people are going to stand before God and there'll be millions there. And you'll cry out to God and it won't, you won't worry about the cr crowd that's there. But today, you that lifted your hand and say, Preacher, I'm not right with God, but I want to be. Will you get up out of your seat and come up here to the front of this building right now? Just get up out of your seat and come up here. Here's a young lady coming. Here's a young man coming. You others that lifted your hand, would you like to come up here? Just come up here and stand. Pastor, you have altar crew that will help us. They're going to lead you to the Lord this morning. Is there others here? You'd like to come right now. Just come and stand here. You altar workers that know how to pray, will you come up here and pray with these? Leave these to the Lord this morning. Just let Jesus do what he does. Now, you that lifted your hand and say, I want a door, God, to open a door for me. I don't know how, but I'm going to take these tools as preacher preached about. I'm going to explain salvation. But I want God to go ahead of me and work ahead of me and open this door. I want you to get up and come to the front and begin to pray and ask God to open that door. God, if you'll open the door, I'll step in it. If you'll open the door, I'll step in it. While these altar workers are working with these that come this morning for Jesus, I want you to come and just stand up here. And I want you to begin to pray, God, open the door. Open the door. If you'll open the door, Lord, I'll walk through it. If you'll open the door, Lord, I will walk through it. I'll use these tools. I'll do what I need to do. But let me plant a seed in their life that needs Jesus. Now, while they're praying with these that need Jesus in their heart and life, I want you to call on God right now. Just say, God, you open the door. You open the door. You open the door in Jesus' name. Again, thank you so much for joining us online at the Assembly. We hope this message encouraged you and we would love to stay connected. So be sure to click the link below and contact us. We look forward to seeing you this Sunday.